about quarter of the way through how much work this is. And I was like, okay, it's a lot of work. But at the same time, I was like, well, to be honest, I have nothing better to do. And to be honest, they, I do need to build this sort of like, I wanted to make it like this holy Bible of this is this should be the the one thing that you need. And then you'll be able to use Unreal, you'll be able to use Brushify, you'll be able to do all the stuff. Uh, and basically, it's everything you need to get to the point that, you know, the, the workflow that I'm at now where I can just bang out an environment in, you know, a few minutes. In this episode of the Learn Squared podcast, we welcome Unreal Engine wizard, Joe Goth. Joe has spent almost his entire career in and around game engines. And we're thrilled that his Learn Squared course will be teaching how you can create stunning real-time environments in Unreal Engine. In this episode, we get a deeper insight into Joe's career. From working on passion projects which led to getting hired, through to developing tools for Unreal Engine, and working on that Pixel Rebirth project. And of course, we cover how and why he built his Learn Squared course, Unreal Environments. This one's packed full of insight and info. Buckle up and let's go. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but the, the sort of, uh, I guess the niche that I, I sort of spotted was that, uh, and the problem that Unreal Engine has in general, is that it doesn't have a sort of pre-built library and a sort of shaders library, an asset library that yeah. you can grab. So, okay, you can grab things like the Kite demo, but it's almost like the demo that Epic worked on back in 2015, huh? where, you know, s- some things are it's a demo you know it's like things aren't a sort of packaged ready to use sort of final shader product you mm. know so things like the landscape shader there are sort of unfinished um things aren't packaged really neatly um and and things aren't really optimized in in the way that they could be so i think like while while a kite demo is really really cool and it's it's got all of the elements that you need to start building stuff in unreal mm-hmm. it doesn't take it to that next level that i think that what I'm hope, you know, what I hope that Brushify has become now, uh, which is something mm. that people can just grab this thing and it gives you instantly the ability to just start sculpting terrain and it will automatically just texture it and you don't have to worry about performance. You don't have to think about that stuff. Uh, you don't have to worry about oh, where am I going to get these uh, trees from? Where am I going to get these yeah. assets from? It's all just there. Um, and I think that was just just missing that sort of accessibility. Mm from unreal engine in general and like when you got into um unreal like how quickly did you identify that how how soon did you start feeling that like there was this missing and there it would be great to have this well it sort of started because i was when i was at crytech i'd sort of you know i'd been building cinematics and the approach with building cinematics was always that in you know instead of every single time you do a cinematic project you don't want to have to build assets from scratch that are just stock assets Mm. so it's that typical thing where okay we were doing uh five you know four or five different games and all of them would have explosions and bullet uh, vfx we would have you know these typical things that you just use uh, walls breaking down all those kind of things that you would be reusing over and over again and so what i ended up doing was just building up a sort of asset library of all those things and so I'd kind of taught myself like, oh, well, you know, what if I need a rocky ground? Oh, well, I've got these ones that have downloaded from Megascans and I've thrown mm-hmm. them in the folder. And then, and then, you know, I've built these visual effects for the bullet impacts and explosions and things. And, and then I just, whenever there was a project, like a trailer project coming along, I just take from that library, I just reuse it. And it's just like pick, you know, pick and mix, mm-hmm. I, I mix and match and, and, maybe i take an explosion and change it a little bit and then that's the explosion you see in you know the latest trailer for uh crisis or warface or you know even even rise you know and 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 that was the kind of way that i worked and when i was going forward into you know leaving crytek and then moving into unreal engine and i started to work on uh the very first game i was working on was this indie game Mm -hmm. uh, called outlaws and what I realized there was that it was just like, there isn't really a good automatic landscape material for Unreal Engine. Uh, we were trying to build this massive, massive landscape uh, in, in, in size. Yeah. And it was just like the asset just wasn't there. It didn't exist. 
So I ended up having to build something uh, basically from scratch, basically mm-hmm. I reworked a bunch of auto materials and, and, you know, marketplace. And then that was what we ended up shipping the game. And it wasn't a good solution. It wasn't a good shader. So after that project, I just decided, well, I'm not doing that again, messing around with other people's stuff. I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to write my own auto material mm-hmm. from scratch. And um, it took, I would say, a month or two of before it got to the point where I was like very confident that what I'd made was better than basically anything I'd seen on Marketplace. Sure. Um, and and then I yeah I was basically like okay well now I'm now I'm onto something. Uh, and then I started to just release these uh, Brushify packs and mm-hmm. making each of those packs, uh, you know, looking good, having their own dedicated assets. Um, having having alpha brushes sculpt, sculpting brushes that were packaged with them that you know the users can use to actually generate their own terrain mm-hmm. uh, very rapidly and and it sort of formed as that kind of idea of like it's the same thing as I was doing before at Crytek it's it's an asset library it's a yes. database of uh, of different assets and and also I I also totally love Quixel's approach to this and Quixel are also the pioneers in this right Mm-hmm. They created the photogrammetry asset library to rule all photogrammetry asset libraries. Mm-hmm. So that approach of building a library of generic, high-quality assets is just something I completely get behind and I think is mm-hmm. is the key. Um, because the cool thing is that once you've actually built some sort of a scene, you can then take that, rework it, build it into something that looks completely stylistically different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and like Rebirth's a great example of that, yes. uh, where, you know, we had this sort of cool science fiction style, almost almost Blade Runner style design yes. concept for this structure in Iceland, and you know, Iceland's a really cool terrain because it's all sort of alien looking. Yep. And uh, and yeah, it, it just it just really like f- flows very nicely into uh, the those Icelandic photogrammetry assets. Yes. And, and like uh, with yeah. um, Brushify. So did you know what Brushify was going to become when you began that journey? Or was it, um, just like you mentioned before, was it more a case of like, I just really want to build this tool um, and, and this library for me to be able to work the way I want to work and with that freedom? Is that how it began? Or was it like a, a more yeah. of a deliberate approach to um, what Brushify is actually what it became? Well, I'd been looking into, you know, okay, so the the issue that I'd identified with uh Quixel, which I, I really, you know, hu- hugely love Quixel and mm-hmm. support them. And I think everything they've done is absolutely great. But the one thing that they weren't doing was, and that's because it's a technical limitation more than anything, mm-hmm. is is they weren't scanning mountains, yeah. right? So, <laughs> I mean, that's something that's really, really hard. Like, you, yeah. you can't really do it. So, I but I thought like, okay, well, how far could I get if I take you know, digital elevation models, if I take LiDAR point cloud data, and then I do the hard work of basically, you know, creating, um, basically, uh, texturize, creating basically a texturizer in mm-hmm. World Machine uh, that can create fairly realistic looking mountains. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, that sort of started my approach of like, okay, artistically, can I do this? And then it was like, you know, getting to the point where I've got now some mountains that look fairly photorealistic. And I'm now in the position where I can, oh, that's actually really cool. I've built mm-hmm. these assets. And and then it was just the next step of like, well, now I should probably sell them, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I th- um, you know, that idea came along pretty early, but I think yeah. it was it was that everything started to come together when I worked in Unreal Engine 4 for a while and then realized what was possible there, you right. know, in terms of fleshing it out with my own shaders and stuff. Um, because that's where it really came together as this, you know, an entire pipeline, an entire workflow. It's not just a few alpha brushes that you can, you know, quickly sculpt mountains with. Mm-hmm. It's it's more than that because you've got the terrain working with it. And yes. then you've got, you know, shaders dedicated for, you know, a rock has its own shader and that shader has a bunch of other features in it. Like mm-hmm. maybe you want to put snow on all the rocks or maybe you want to have them, you know, blend in with the with the landscape and you know, it's just a tick box away when you've mm-hmm. got all of those shaders set up already. So how long has Brushify been around now? 
When did it actually begin? Up until I now? think it's been about two years. Two years. I think it started in 2018. Yeah. Uh, middle of 2018. That's when I first. Was launched. that when you left? Um, was that when you were? Was that after Rebirth or during? Uh, when you did Rebirth. It was so I left Crytek. I think sometime in March 2018. Yeah. And then I think I started on Outlaws. And I think it was basically like, yeah, it, basically sometime after Outlaws that I really realized and got cracking on Brushify. Ah. And and then it was like, yeah. And, and I think then it was a few months before Quixel even got in touch with me about Rebirth. Ah, okay. So yeah, it was, it was like, a, you know, I had plenty of time to kind of like, build up brushify and i think yeah Br brushify had already i'd already got a few packs out by the time the quixel got in touch with me for sure. rebirth and stuff um and then you know and then i was just like uh you know spending i think it was like six months working on rebirth and th it was it was really great because i was you know kind of you know working on brushify a bit working on rebirth a bit and nice. there were times where obviously rebirth took tons of my time because yes. that to do a project like that i think it's it's you know, it's pretty crazy because I think a lot of the the preparation work for it is a lot more than people imagine. Because yeah. it's like all that you see in the end are these sort of like, oh, it looks so photorealistic. You know, yeah. it's like the end result. But you know what what goes into those few shots, you know, are tons and tons of of shots that you're either you're like you're redoing them or you know things aren't right or you know you're going to the art director and you're going like, oh, does this look good? Does that mm -hmm. look good? And it's like. Okay, I'm gonna spend the whole day working on this little patch of grass <laughs> to make it look like it's real, and then it's just like painstaking, you know, like hand placement and uh, you know, really making sure that every rock looks right. But you know, we we did use a lot of procedural tools as well. Like Houdini was was mm. really useful for for especially for you know doing some of the uh, the distributions and scattering things. Uh, Houdini was just really good for yeah. that. Um, yeah, like there's but, yeah, a really I mean, nice integration with um Twixel and Houdini. I've messed around with it a little bit myself, um, just enough for what I need it for, and it is quite friendly if you kind of can understand it. So I'm sure for the guys that do understand it, it's like amazing. Um, but like with the um and and again um just to touch upon the uh, Quixel Rebirth project is like uh, I've used uh Quixel pretty much like whenever it's needed. It's like I I I love the tool. Um, I love what it offers just purely because these amazing assets you can bring it in. Um, but then obviously when I saw Rebirth, that definitely didn't look the kind of stuff that I was using. So I thought this is more than just me importing assets and, you know, lighting them a little bit. Like there's clearly more more to this. Um, mm. So I, and I think like if you speak to anybody who's seen that, it is probably one of the iconic um, not even just like in terms of a short, but in terms of like, I guess, like a technical achievement with um like like real time assets and things like that as well like that have been done for a while um definitely got raised a lot of eyebrows and i guess you know had people's mouth watering when they when they saw it how long did that project take so it yeah i think 2018 whole, when it began right uh i think it was already oh i don't know i think it was the end of 2018 oh okay three, maybe it was around this time i think it's probably it was probably about august september that we started mm -hmm. in 2018 and then i think it was three maybe three months then christmas we took a bit of a break and then we had the la last few months till gdc so in total i think it was five or six months okay uh and yeah so basically five or six months and and to be honest the first few months were just tons of R and D, as in imagine, like creating yeah. test scenes. Yeah, and we had this, you know, initial test scene where it was just like, uh, you know, okay, create a massive crater and try and basically dress up every single part of it and tr mm. procedurally generate all these rocks and stuff. And you know, we were just trying to get a sense of like, can we pull off this sense of scale sure. in an yeah. Icelandic landscape? And you know, those early tests, they they look okay, but they don't look to that level of photorealism when. Mm every single part of the shot has had the scrutiny of 
you know every single artist on the project yeah and it's you know it's gone through me it's gone through and then it's gone through victor omen and then it's gone through owen o'broin and then it's gone through uh dan you know the vfx uh lead yeah and and everybody um uh yeah yeah so dan, dan woji is just one of these guys that you you can show him any shot and he used to work at Blur, and right. you can show him any shot, and he'll give you the best feedback you've ever gotten, nice. and uh, identify to you exactly what it is that you should tweak here or there, and what's really not holding up. And you know th- that was the great thing is that we just had this perfect team, um, yeah. Uh, and and uh, and everything got very you know it's done very smoothly. Um, and and I also th- think that you know from those early tests to the end result. Uh, I still feel that you know what was cool about the early tests was that they were playable. Like you can actually run around in that Icelandic nice. landscape, and it's yeah. all you know, completely, um, you know, it's it's all completely real time. Uh, and you know, obviously, we decided to you know polish up some some more sort of like cinematic shots for the final thing, and and mm-hmm. make sure that those cinematic shots themselves look just absolutely perfect. But you know that they, they all ran in real time, mm-hmm. uh, and on a 1080 Ti as well. They weren't wow. sort of like um, you know running on a supercomputer or something. Yeah. Uh, they were literally rendered on the PC. I've, I've still got now with a 1080 Ti nice. on it, and uh, you know we we're rendering at 5K, and it just you know uh, it spits out the frames uh, almost in real time. So how, how large was the team overall? Uh, the people I just mentioned, yeah. they, they were the main. Uh, you know, so it was it for for sort of like hands-on cinematic artists. It was myself uh owen o'broin uh and victor omen and then uh dan was supervising us and then above him was teddy and uh and then of course you know a whole host of people doing all the other stuff like sounds and sure. sound yeah. and editing and um you guys, guys at ember lab and uh yeah it was really it was a really really cool project to be a part mm-hmm. of because we had like the the time to to perfect something um and and really show what's possible um with with real-time graphics you know not no without you know so much trickery or anything like that mm-hmm. it's it's really just uh i, I mean we made careful decisions yes. uh, about the lighting and uh you know not i think a, a good decision was to not try and do uh something with too much direct lighting right but but in general uh, you know that's how iceland looks exactly you know? yeah so yeah. it's and, and there were some shots with with some direct lighting in there um so yeah i I just think it's it's down to uh tweaking lighting until it looks absolutely perfect tweaking set dressing until it's absolutely perfect and then yeah i think um i think it shows like like you mentioned you had the time to really perfect it um i mean i guess we've all been on like projects where there hasn't been time so you just have to kind of make the Mm -hmm. most of what you have but being able to and I guess there's always a case where sometimes if you do have time, you can kind of also ruin a project as well, perhaps. Um, but but um, in this case, it clearly shows that, I guess, a, a good combination of people who are at the top of their game, um, good expertise, as well as being able to use their time and make the right decisions, I guess, as well. Um, and yeah, it, just, it looks it looks amazing. Like Even just before the podcast, I watched it again and it's, it looks great. Like, you know, it's CG, but at the same time, it doesn't look CG, even though the parts that do look CG, if that makes sense. Um, mm. and, and I don't think that that's what works really well. Like you, you're not you, only because you know how it was made, you're focusing on those kind of things. But if you didn't, then you'd be looking at exactly for what it is. And it, it's a beautiful piece. Um, so, you know, I think it's awesome. And just to confirm, like with the, with the software that was used on that, obviously that was quick assets. Um, you guys, you obviously used a bit of Houdini, uh, unreal as well. Uh, was it anything else much or was it pretty much the, yeah. the, that trio of software? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess like on most of the scenes that, you know, j- especially during the f- prototyping phase, I was just using Brushify on, as the, the auto material, just putting the auto material on, sculpting the terrain, using some alpha brushes. And cool. then in the end, you know, just decorating that with uh, set dressing from Quixel Megascans. Nice. So like if you look at that final shot, um, it's like it's basically just called fun, uh, finale on my yeah. art station but like that one's a typical example where it's just like you know i i took this big flat plane that's all you know brushify auto material 
and then I just like pepper on top of that thousands of tiny rocks, moss, you know, all of these uh, these things that you know yes. I went through and yeah. sort of painstakingly dressed up. Um, and then yeah, and then in the background as well is also some lidar data from Brushify mm-hmm. that we took into Houdini, and then we texturized it in a certain way as well, so it matches yes. the landscape and. Uh, that was done by um, the guys over at Houdini at Side Effects. Um, uh, they actually they actually worked on the project as well and helped us with uh, with some of the texturization and uh, stuff for the mountains. So yeah, I mean it was all just like a a really a great team effort with lots of you know companies involved mm-hmm. and, uh, and lots of people involved. So you know I definitely can't take credit for most of it, but I would say that you know definitely what helped me in my prototyping phase was that I had Brushify already. Um, and you know, that I could just play around and sculpt and sort of, you know, you know, I just built like a, a moss paint layer into mm-hmm. the, the auto material I already had. And then I was just able to just paint some moss down and, and, and play with it. And, you know, it's really helpful for composition and stuff when you can nice. do that. So effectively Brushify was your first step and then everything else kind of built on top of that. Exactly. Just, just to really yeah. bring it, bring it through that. That's awesome. It's um, like once once you've got something like that, you can you know you've got that forever. It's like okay, I've done this, I've done the thing. Now I can just take it and use it forever from this point onward yes. on any freelancing projects or any you know game projects. Take it, adapt it, and that's the great thing with Unreal is all the shaders. It's all visual coding. Yes. So if you need to tweak anything, you can just do it. And like, are you? I guess you guess you're you're clearly into into coding. Like, what's your knowledge on that? How did you get that knowledge? Um, is that I'm something not, you've always been into, or is it something you kind of fell into? Uh, well, I, I did computing in in A level, uh, but you know, I, I wouldn't say I was especially motivated or, or especially good programmer, or mm. you know, a, a sort of like typical programmer. Uh, I've always been able to, you know, if I spend long enough on a problem, I'm the kind of person that I'll just get obsessed with a problem and then yes. spend enough time on it to the point where eventually something will come out the other end and yes. you know it might look like you know i've i've figured something out but really what it was is just like pure just determination yes you know i'm certainly not the smartest cookie or something it's just that <laughs> i and i just don't give up right. and so you know okay maybe a, a really clever programmer might spend an hour on that problem and wow he's cracked it but yeah. i also i look at it like this maybe i'm not the best programmer in the world but if i spend a day on it Instead, you know, it maybe takes me longer, but well, if I spend a day on it and it's done, then it's done. Mm. And I don't have to look yeah. at it anymore. It's not like I have to invent an auto material or work out all the problems related to, you know, programming a really complicated shader. Yeah. I don't have to do that every single day. I just had to do it once, mm. like a year and a half ago, you know, nice. a year ago, two years ago. And and now that's done. And I've got, you know, it, it's allowed me to build up a bit more of an understanding about you know how the shader system works in Unreal, and and I think that to be honest, the the fact that it's visual coding means that it's accessible uh, for people like me that don't want to compile text-based code. Yeah, I've never really been interested in it. I don't mm-hmm. want to you know become a programmer in that traditional sense. Mm-hmm. But um, you know all of the all the shader compiling in Unreal is done right then and there in the editor, um, and and then it's it's all good to go in real time. So you can just be artistic with it from the get-go as opposed to having to yeah. tweak and adjust and, you know, rerun things. Exactly. Um, yeah, my whole thing is more that, you know, I'd rather focus on things from a photography perspective, from a photographic yes. perspective, yes. And, and, you know, focus on things like uh, lighting and, and color theory and composition and not worry about the nitty-gritty of, you know, how the technical stuff works. Yeah. Um, like for from my angle as like say as a concept artist especially with the advent of like bringing like 3d into your workflow then using um render engines again like using lighting and all that kind of stuff um the key things what you just mentioned it was a case of like oh now i can really focus on just a composition or work in, work in the camera or you know the lighting etc etc as opposed to having to repaint it over and over again um and then now as it's progressed into you got these more real-time tools it is like you just mentioned it is, it is more a case of like you're just really focusing on on things such as cinematography um and and photography free as well um is like 
like how how long have you been because obviously you worked on games for a very long time um like have you been into photography and uh, cinematography f- for a while or is it something that has kind of grown since you've been messing with uh, real time engines it is, it is interesting At, when i was a cinematic artist what was very strange about me was that i didn't have that much of an interest in real cameras and i don't know why that is i just i was always more interested in the digital side of things and yeah. digital artwork and you know the stuff this you know the screenshots i was kicking out I, you know I'm, I'm still proud of the ones i did when i was a teenager even i still think they look cool and mm. you know I, I i don't mind them at all uh, i would say though that there's definitely a lot to be learned over the years from real, you know, that I've learned from real and the sort of limitations of, of a real camera Mm. add a lot to a digital scene. So, you know, but yeah, but I, I would say that it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's interesting that in the last sort of four or five years, I got more into real photography and, you know, started, I guess, I guess that's also the thing is that it's a very expensive hobby. And yes. when you're young, <laughs> yeah. it's not necessarily the thing that you're going to want to be able to do, which is running out and buying uh, a really awesome camera. Yeah. It's just like, well, you know, you've got your phone camera, uh, you've got, you know, maybe some really small compact thing or whatever when, mm-hmm. you know, back in back in 2006 or whatever yeah. it was, yeah. back when that stuff was still going. Um, but, you know, in general, it wasn't like I, I had a thousand quid to, to go or two thousand quid to go and spend on. Yeah whatever the latest is from sony or panasonic or or whatever um but you know i mean i think in the last four or five years i I started heavily investing in in micro four thirds um i'm you know now now on my like fourth or fifth camera Mm. um and i've just grown a little they're just growing in my house like, (laughs) like and lenses and oh it's terrible so you know it's just one of those things where yeah it's um you know, and, 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 but, I, but I do think that what's great with, you know, getting out there and doing real photography is that you then get a full understanding of all of the technical terms mm. and the film industry terms that are being used in Unreal Engine. So, so mm-hmm. for instance, if you go in the camera in Unreal Engine, you'll find all of the different parameters there. Like, uh, you know, you'll find the f stop, you'll find the film back, you'll be yeah. able to choose what camera system is, is being emulated. Um, and you'll be able to really design uh, a cinematic shot in the same way that, you know, maybe you photograph something in a certain light and, and you could emulate that exact uh, mm-hmm. look. But yeah. And obviously real time's like becoming a bit of a big deal now. It's like at the forefront of everyone's minds um, like from multiple different fields, let alone... Um, like obviously initially it was just more to do with i guess games because it may you can make all these amazing worlds that people could play through and unreal i guess is still built in the sense of like as as a place where people can build and make their games and obviously play them as well um but then obviously you got like the artistic angle which is the angle that i'll definitely be coming at it from because it's like in unreal has really interested me for a while but it's something that i've kind of put off purely because of my um, perception of the learning curve of it and the time it would take to do it but obviously the course that's coming out now is going to be a great way to combat that and then even on things like um the filmmaking side as well um, and even the visualization side because i know there's like um unreal do talk about how you can um effectively like render cars and things like that as well in mm. in the engine um and obviously mandalorian is a great example of how it's been used on tv shows and, and productions so um like what are your thoughts on that like how important do you think real-time engines are going to be going forward and do you think they will take over a lot of the tools that have been used previously i i, I think it is really just a matter of time and i you know it's it's interesting because back when i first started at uh crytek even in 2009 yeah. you know we were doing all of our cinematics and rendering them all in real time yeah so i mean for me what's crazy is that like that whole approach of rendering all your cinematics out in real time and and you know uh you know that is nothing new to me so it's mm. like the whole yeah. time i've had a sort of professional career doing this 
has all always been real time. And it's always just been this thing of like, well, when are Hollywood going to catch on? Yes. When are yes. they finally going to realize that, you know, this is possible now? And I think, you know, James Cameron did the previews for Avatar, for instance, in yeah. Maya uh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was rendered in Maya. And, you know, it just looked awful. Yeah. Like It was just like the most rudimentary uh, lighting, you know, the most. But of, of course, it told the story and that was all that was needed. Yeah. And that's, you know, what it was. But, you know, there, there were definitely things that, you know, when we were at Crytek, we were like, well, why can't we get this? Why can't we get, you know, someone like him on board? Why can't we mm. get a movie studio on board to to work with us and, and to kind of bring this technology and make it into... Um, a reality yeah and it was kind of this fo this focus on that for a bit you know and and then you know it's sort of just like i think over the years it, it just became this thing of like well when is it going to happen uh because it's got to be that at some point that catches on and i, th I think it was just really that you know it needed the right engine it needed the right hardware um and and i think the biggest problem was that getting assets into a game engine it was always really, really hard in the past. Mm. And so it wasn't always that you could just go for, uh, you know, Quixel mega scans and then just bring it over in the Quixel bridge. And then, oh, suddenly you've got this photorealistic rock. Yeah. yeah. You know, you couldn't go onto the Unreal Marketplace and just buy a Brushify pack. And then yeah. suddenly I've got this scene that's looking like basically okay. You know, it's like, oh, wow, I could actually film a, a scene there. Things are mm. so much easier now. Whereas, you know, back in the past, it was like, if I wanted to build something that looks, like a photorealistic scene or something i need to just you know start from scratch i need to model my own rocks yeah. i need to know what i'm doing on every single asset and the import process uh you know wasn't good it, mm. it used to take ages i mean back with udk it was to get an asset in was sometimes really painstaking back with cryengine you know in 2007 or something it was awful trying <laughs> to get a character in it it would take two days you know wow. to just like you know just fiddling around with things just to try and get your rig working into yeah. the engine uh and even just exporting basic geometry you, you'd be hit with error messages you'd be hit with all this stuff so you know 10 years ago things were just not there yet in terms of usability for these game mm -hmm. engines and i think ue4 is probably the first engine that i would say is to the point now where the user interface is so slick um yeah. things are so sort of like drag and drop that and you know, with, with these direct connections, you know, the direct connection to the marketplace where you just click a button and mm. add the project, and it's all done for you. It's all handled for you. Um, that's that's just the that was kind of like the ticket that's that was needed uh, to to get people in yes. and to make it something that's really viable. Um, and and that's you know more of a sort of like, um, I, I guess the other the other half of the thing is that it's more of a marketing thing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, I think Epic Game, uh, Epic Games do a great job of marketing the engine. They have the industry connections, and they've built yes. good industry connections with the movie industry. Um, you know, like Lucas Arts or, or yes. uh, what is it? Did Disney? Sorry, not yeah. <laughs> yeah. the other one. Yeah. Um, they sold it now. But yeah, so Mandalorian, for instance. I mean, it's Star Wars. You know, it's yes. it's John Favreau. It's big. Uh, it's big studios mm -hmm. working with the engine, and, and it's very visible. Um, and you know that's something that's needed to sort of bring people on and and and, and onboard people, onboard new users. Mm. And I think another thing as well is, especially like when just because I guess like I always categorize um, consumers in two types. Like when they when they watch or consume something, the ones that just want it for entertainment, um, and then the others that are like say more on the creative side who are not only using it for entertainment but they're also like in the back of their mind thinking, how do I make something like this? I would love to make something like this. Or if I was in charge of this, I would have done things this way. Mm. And then um, something like Unreal, um, and even just the tools available now, how quickly you can, like you mentioned, you can just drag and drop and get things in there. Um, it does take you, I guess, back to how it used to be as a kid where you can just play with Legos and build yeah. your little little sets and just, just carry on playing straight away. Um, but then also like the projects like... Um, like like you mentioned avatar avatar um technically and for what it did to the industry um and again really the way, the way it changed that type of filmmaking if you were to make like a cg heavy film it was a game changer but again it seemed 
very inaccessible unless you had the connections, the equipment, the budget, all that kind of stuff. I mean, like everything was almost proprietary, right? Um, but then when you look at, say, Mandalorian, and then you see that, oh, they just use the same software that I can download in, yep. you know, two clicks away myself, although you might not be able to get the same kind of stage and what have you, um, for those people that do get triggered that way where they can see, okay, they're doing something like this. I'm going to try my best to do something like this. The same way you did with Brushify was a case of like you saw a gap and then you you just worked on it until you got the tool that you wanted. Um, there's There's something cool with that like the fact that it's not just catering to um professionals that have the tools and resources but it's also like i guess came to the hobbyist angle as well where anyone can kind of do it and technically not pay an arm and leg to do it as well um as opposed to like having to buy ridiculously expensive 3d software like you know 10 years ago that you'd have to do they need to be accessible on on an individual level Mm -hmm. and i think that companies that cater for the individual especially in something like tech uh often do very very well Mm. so apple uh back in the personal computing revolution they had sort of their founding doctrine was that they cater for an individual they weren't making computers for companies they weren't making a computer where it's like you know 20 people are going to be using this computer they're making a computer that is a personal computer. And that idea of it's your personal computer that means that you get to enhance the power of your brain. Mm. You get to have that sort of, you know, Steve Jobs called it the bicycle for the mind thing. Yeah. And and so like that idea of like everyone gets to enhance their brain, everyone gets to enhance their ability uh, is the core sort of principle of, of a lot of successful businesses nowadays. Mm. And I think that's what Unreal Engine will, you know, will be successful at is that it's it's taking something that was once only possible if you were you know james cameron a multi you know multi-million millions maybe billions i don't know you know dollar director who has you know all this money to throw at a project and you know he gets to to do these awesome renders uh you know because he's got whole studio working for him well imagine that now you can get a very very small team or even an an individual Mm -hmm. and they could kick out something of a similar quality level that's the way that we're headed and it's just like that great enabler on an individual level it's not that we're making companies or groups uh better i mean they will get better too but they're going to get better because every single individual in that group is going to have this amplifier and it's like a you know this amplifier or multiplier of everyone's abilities yeah like a like a they're not cultivating an ecosystem as yeah. opposed to just trying to make a monopoly. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really cool. And I guess like even, um, cause you went to, did you go to university? No, I didn't. No, I left, uh, I left England, uh, left for an internship at Crytek when I was oh, okay. eight. So, and, uh, uh, 18, what year, how, what year was that? That was 2000, I think early 2009. 2009 so like to get any oh, that was my last year at uni that, that at that time and like we were being i did industrial design so we were being taught things like maya uh, alias and all these kind of things um mm. uh bunk speed if you ever remember that one which i think ended up becoming part of solidworks or whatever basically it was key shot before key shot was a thing um every single one of those was like thousands of pounds just to even yeah. get so it's, i know they had like that's when autodesk started doing the education educational licenses um but it's just that like accessibility was just very difficult and even then a lot of people did end up um acquiring the software by other means but then some of them wouldn't work properly or they'd crash or what have you yeah where just imagine back then or even like the students now where nearly everything that you need you can just get or even if you save up for a couple of months let alone having saved for a year you can afford to get a very good setup to be able to build what you want um and just just not at the same time learn your craft but also fulfill your passion as well and for the companies such as like unreal and epic and all these other guys as well that are like with the tools they're making and the accessibility of them to really cultivate that to recognize that and to keep pushing that as well is only gonna 
reap rewards in terms of like the quality of things we'll be seeing, experiencing, um, and overall as well. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are going to make like not so great things, but that's with anything, right? Um, so I, I think I think it's awesome, and even like say with them. Um, with your career because in the in the course and when the first lessons you mentioned obviously how you got into the industry and it was kind of like a, a similar thing right it was like more of a hobbyist thing that got you into the industry and recognized is that correct yeah exactly yeah uh, it was actually working on a on a mod team um we yeah. were working on this mod called Lightspire um with a friend of mine uh ashton anderson mm-hmm. and yeah we, we were basically um we were really just kids you know yeah back then but uh, but you know what was what was great was that we we'd managed to you know there was a he'd got together this incredible team of artists, um, and you know we were able to basically get all these assets built, and then I was you know tasked with sort of bringing them into the engine yeah. and making them look good, you know actually like and and it was kind of like you know it was fakery really like mm-hmm. it was you know trying to make this mo- looking like make something in the engine that looks like the most badass triple a game yeah that's you know it's not a triple a game it's yeah. it's a bunch of kids you know working you know kind of around the clock you know different what times was the average age type. of you guys oh, I, I was 17 at the time wow. uh i think you know i think ashton was two years older than me yeah. or a couple of years older but you know we were all around that age you know it wasn't really like um you know and and what's interesting as well is that the the vast majority of the people on that team did end up going into industry jobs nice based on the artwork that they had you know pulled off back then because yeah. it just looked so badass like mm. a lot of a lot of the the character designs and the concept art and and i think ashton's vision for it was so cool that you know it just it inspired everybody and uh and you know seeing that whole thing you know, it was so cool for me to be able to get those, you know, the 3D art assets from from the character artists and stuff, and actually put them into the engine, and then start. Mm-hmm. You know, I was using 3D Studio Max back then, and I was sort of posing them and building sort of primitive rigs for them, and then posing them, yeah. and then you know, bringing them into the engine, and then faking all the visual effects, you know, to you know, faking all the fire and all of yeah. the kind of uh, magical VFX, you know, and. Um, but you know, it was really cool to be able to to sort of build something that looks like a fantasy game. Yeah. Uh, but you know, obviously, the the mod never really got finished. Mm-hmm. It was just one of those things where it's like, uh, you know, it, it ends up as a bunch of really pretty looking screenshots, but you know, it didn't actually come to fruition. And you know, that's more of a sort of money thing than anything yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While it is really cool to make a mod and and that kind of stuff, is that you know, eventually you're a bunch of 17 18 year olds and you know your parents are telling you get a job (laughs) so you're not you're not in the position where you're able to you know just kind of mess around and and, you know everyone has to eventually go to university or you know get a real job and and you know do something with their lives life takes over right like you know the life takes over um i was very very lucky to to get a job in the games industry though so yeah was that like um you, you kind of mentioned it or you kind of explained it with how it came about but that was purely like a passion project between you guys right absolutely yeah it was never like a strategy of like we're going to use this to get the attention of companies and what have you etc cetera, etc cetera. no i didn't even think about that awesome. i was just doing it i was just doing it but i to be honest uh this whole thing i, I never really thought about like you know whether or not you know, there weren't there was no real tactic behind it or something it was mm. just I I purely like to use CryEngine, and I okay. just wanted to see if I could do it. I wanted to see if I could make something that looked cool, um, and I think that's the really beautiful thing about the internet and about the way that things are. Yeah. You know, even more so now because that was back in the days of sort of like web forums and things. Mm. And there were you know, back then there was a forum for, that Crytek owned called CryMod, right. and that's a, you know a really cool place for everyone to sort of socialize and show off their work. Yeah, but now it's even better because you've got like Instagram and you've got Twitter and you've got yeah, Art Nation and there are so many different ways. To... Hello. I oh, saw you just you cut out um, at the Art Station bit. Oh yeah, so like Art Station and then you know like Facebook groups, um, mm. you know, and those those ways of kind of showcasing your work that uh, you know everyone's way more connected than they were back in mm. the past. Um, but that's the great thing is that if someone on there sees that you've done some really cool stuff you're instantly going to start getting 
job offers. You're going to yes. get people who are coming and saying, well, you know, even if it's just an internship, uh, it's your foot in the door, right? Yes. If you're somebody that doesn't have, you know, an established place in the games industry or something, that foot in the door could be the difference between actually going and living your dreams mm. or, you know, or, you know, end up working a job that you maybe you don't like or, you know, living a life that you don't necessarily want to live. Um, ba- back when yeah. you're doing that uh, project, um, what was like, I know you mentioned that was purely a passion project and it was just something that you were working on, I guess, to get the most out of the project, um, get the most out of the engine as well. Um, w- at that point in time though, what was like your mindset in terms of your career? Like, did you have an idea where you wanted to be? Did you want to be in games or um was that not something that was on your mind at that time at all i mean at that point i was you know i was doing my a levels and i i would say i'm not a very particularly good academic person mm. i i mean i definitely think that i did well up until about gcse but then when when it came to a levels i lost interests mm. I, I would put it that way i really yeah. lost interest in academic stuff um there's a certain level of complexity to academic stuff before you know you end up having to memorize a lot of stuff. Yes. And when you're not interested in it, um, you know, things like organic organic chemistry or, um, you know, very complex mathematics, I, I, I just got to the point where I was like, well, now I'm just not really interested in doing that. Right. And then you know, it reflected in my work, right? I was, you know, I was wanting to spend all of my time working on CryEngine. And mm. I'm, I'm the kind of person where, when I want to do something, I, I do just do it. And I, I, and it does sometimes hurt the people around me. And I know that's kind of a, it's a negative thing. Like I know that my mom, she couldn't really understand it. She was always in this position where, you know, she'd come in at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. and go, what, Joe, how can you still be awake working on your, your stuff? What is this, yeah. what is this you know, crap that you're working on? And, and, and I, in her defense, you know, now as a, as a 30, almost 30 year old, I get that, you know, where she was coming from, she wanted yes shield me from this sort of self de- in her eyes self-destruction yes. because she thought oh wow this you know my, i've got this teenage boy he's not doing his academic work he's not doing his a levels the way that he should and that this could be a terrible thing for him in the long run if, if he doesn't you know uh you know get these qualifications or whatever so you know in her eyes it's like a very crazy thing that and and also, also it's not an industry that you know especially my parents you know their generation they don't really understand mm. Yeah, you know, they they had no guarantees at all that this was something that could possibly even be a career. Mm. What they're seeing is just like, oh, he's got a computer, and on the screen is just all these video game things like wizards and dragons and stuff. <laughs> and it's like he's doing CG stuff, but it's yeah. like, well, what is that? You know, yes. they can't tell the difference between that and the video game stuff. Yeah. So in their eyes, it's very like, you know, it's it's a very dangerous place to be in. But, you know, I was kind of single minded when I was a teenager and mm-hmm. I just did, I did, I just sort of kind of went against, against the grain and I just spent the time working on my stuff, which, yeah, it's a definitely a double edged sword. But, you know, all these years later, I talked to my parents about it and, you know, that they understand it and they're, you know, pretty mm-hmm. okay with it. It's just that, you know, they accept the fact that I was a, a terrible teenager. <laughs> right? So, But, you know, it's, it, it is what it is, right? Um, yeah. you've got, but I think that definitely I was maybe quite extreme back then and right. if I could live it again. I would maybe try and communicate more with my parents. I sure. would try, and, you know, sort of, you know, find a better balance there because I wasn't really being super smart about it. Mm. But I think that's very hard when you're younger. Um, and, and, you know, because I, I don't think I even could really, um, you know, I, I couldn't really explain it because I didn't have a plan myself, really. Mm. It was just this, it was sort of like going with the flow kind yeah. of thing. It was just like, well, I, I feel the pull of, of this thing. And I, it's mm. like going downstream. Yeah. And, and wherever that leads me, I don't know. But it's, yeah. Just something uh, that you like, you had to completely compel to put in the hours in. Um, but again, there was just like a huge thick fog in front of you, not knowing where it's going to end up, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's very strange how mm. how life works that way. And I almost felt a sort of a similar thing with Brushify that was, you know, mm. a very similar thing where I ended up just, you know, 
I, I'd left, I'd left Crytek. I'd left that sort of, you know, I was there for almost, it was nine years. So I, you know, I'd left sort of like, they were my friends. They were almost like a family there sure. at Crytek, you know, and people that I'd known for, for so long and to sort of leave them and, and then be on my own. And, you know, in this situation where I'm, I'm working with people, you know, I'm working from home and I'm working mm -hmm. with people, you know, across, across the other side of the planet, you know, freelancing and mm -hmm. stuff. And I was kind of, again, left to my own devices. And I think that was the cool thing is that when I was kind of left to my own devices, it was then this thing of like, well, where is it going to take me? Yeah. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I feel like I have some sort of like, uh, you know, comes to the, the, what my mind wants to do next. Mm. It, it does decide it for, for me a little bit. I don't really feel like there's a sort of tactic though to it. Mm. Um, it's just that what you know. I guess I guess I, I what I what I do think helps is that I have my heroes. You know, mm. um, I I wouldn't say you know, um, I wouldn't say necessarily like the way Steve Jobs was. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I hear these horrible stories about him, yeah. but I definitely think like some of the ideas that he had were really cool ideas. Yeah. Uh, and I see his contributions to computing, and I understand where he was coming from. Yeah. Um. You know, and, and, you know, and I, I have these sort of like, you know, and Bill Gates as well, you know, and I have, yeah. I have these sort of list of heroes, um, that I look at them and, and the way that they've changed people's lives. Yeah. And I realize that like, if I can just apply some of those similar ideas, maybe it's going to do something good. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's going to help, um, you know, and, and solve people's problems. Uh, I, think, I think it is important to have like those beacons those heroes like you do look up to um no matter how like far ahead they may seem to be or how impossible it is to reach their heights um i think it is super important super even if you like don't think about that you might always have that subconsciously in your head like mm -hmm. okay that person did this this is what they went through and i think like steve jobs is a, is a fascinating um like like person like his story is fascinating like when I was familiar with him was obviously when Apple really became big. Um, when it became like, I remember when it used to be, um, cause I used to work in sales for, since I was like 16, 17. So any Apple product was more for like someone who could afford it slowly yeah. to when I left that, um, it was like everybody wanted an Apple product of some kind, um, over the, the common thing that was there before. And then you look at him and I remember like, looking at him when he had these black polo necks and what have you, he looks him really like, like sensible person, very calm, very chilled out. Yet when you study him, you see almost like this, this volatile person, this volatile character who can basically be a bit of a dick to people as well. Yeah. Um, and then you hear that, you hear that kind of story or that formula of successful people so many times, like across many, many different industries. Um, but then you look at the fact that like, the impact that person has made let alone on um the field they're in like in technology um but also th like how it has enabled so many other different walks of life and industries to maybe do things that they may never have thought were possible otherwise or cultivate like say this culture of like oh like take the app store for example um how many people have made a, a very good living just making games for that particular platform um let alone other aspects as well. And then you also look at like, like, is it possible to do something similar without having to have those negative traits? There's always that kind of side of things as well. Um, but like, like, what was it particularly about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and like, who are your other heroes? Um, what, what key quality about them was it that really stand out to you and make you drawn to them? Yeah, I think I think the interesting thing, I mean, with Steve Jobs, it's definitely the idea of minimalism. It's mm -hmm. it's the idea of art and technology fused together, um, and and the the sort of way that he approached it was was really cool. You know that that sort of idea that instead of just like hiring the best programmer, he'd go with you know the best programmer, but that can also play the guitar. Mm -hmm. and I think that's that's a cool idea too, and I, I think that like that thing of fusing together art technology that's basically you know what's always been you know interesting for me yeah. um now bill gates as well i think that bill gates is interesting because he, he like basically managed to scale computing mm. and make it affordable 
and that's something that's like yeah i mean I, and and i i do think that the the thing that i really love about windows and as a platform i love how windows is an open platform hmm. so i do i do think that definitely steve jobs he got some things right um but i i do think that having a closed platform i'm i'm just not for that i don't mm-hmm. think that's the way that things should work um and so you know obvi- obviously this kind of leads into a little bit the kind of situation that's going on right now with epic and apple yep, yep. Um, but you know I, I i think it's a bit of a hot topic and we're going to have to see sort of how it all pans out sure um but yeah i mean and, and as far as other heroes go um you know i i'd say that like uh Chevat Yurli, the ceo of crytech you know, when I was when I was a teenager, I put him on this pedestal, and I and I was real like you know it was so cool to be able to go and meet your hero, mm-hmm. and and uh, and he's you know a fantastic, uh, he has such fantastic ideas, and that's what you know led to an engine like CryEngine, which mm-hmm. kind of pushed the real time graphics side of things. So I mean, and I think that to be honest, if CryEngine wasn't successful, I don't know if we'd have some of the ideas that are currently in Unreal Engine. Right. Because because it was sort sort of like this thing where, you know, there was no other engine really where you could uh, there was a sort of level editor that was what you see is what you play. So it's it's like it's not just it's it's the place where you design the level and you're yeah. moving objects around. But any moment you can click play or you know control G back then it was mm-hmm. uh, and you just press control G and then suddenly you're you're jumping into the game and you're actually playing it as if you were running the actual executable of the game so it's you know and that's just something we take for granted now with unreal engine it's just there it's just built mm. in um so yeah definitely like that initial approach that was a really really cool idea and one of those ideas that like i think was a game changer for sure and um you know i think even in udk i don't think it was quite that level of real time yet so the un- udk is basically the uh, Unreal Developer Kit that came yeah. out, so it's Unreal Engine three basically, mm-hmm. um, and um, yeah, I think even by that point they didn't have this sort of what you see is what you play yeah. real time yet. But yeah, and uh, what was um, how did your job at Crytek come about then? What was that like? Was it like uh, did someone reach out to you? Was it a conversation or was it how did that how did that all pan out? Yeah, I think I just got an email and and they were basically. Yeah, they needed somebody in their cinematic department. And um, yeah, I I already knew. So I basically was also on the forums uh, helping out as a moderator as Mm. well. And so I'd kind of got to this point where on the forums I was quite well known. Mm. uh, And I knew, you know, some of the people running the forum. I was posting all the time. I was posting (laughs) almost every single day. I was kind of helping people out around the forum, helping people with their problems, you know, and and I had a, a few thousand posts or something. And and I think that that just kind of all added up to me being a sort of visible member of the community. Yeah, that people knew about me, uh, and then also I had a kind of body of work as well. So, you know, that it wasn't difficult to kind of, you know, to, to kind of see how it happened now. Mm-hmm. But, but you know, what's interesting is that I didn't try to do that necessarily. I wasn't sure. trying to kind of market myself. It, I was just, I was just doing it because I was yeah. always that kind of person that's like you know i i had a portfolio because people said you know the first thing you should do is get a portfolio so i was like well well, i need a portfolio because that's just a cool thing to do right yeah yeah. it's not that i actually thought like go into the games industry or something it was just that yeah i don't know it's like anything when you get into something um you know even if it's just a sort of hobby you do follow the advice of those sort of expert people who have been successful in that field. Um, I mean, right now I'm sort of getting back into into hiking and stuff mm-hmm. and, and doing more outdoors thing, it, more of the outdoors kind of stuff and camping and, um, you know, and, and, and I think it's interesting because, you know, I, I'm just following advice from people from YouTube about, you know, what's the first thing that you do with this? Well, what, how yeah. do you put together a backpack? How do you, what, gear should i buy how should i you know how do you tie that this knot and then um you know it kind of it kind of just goes like well you just follow the people's advice and then you start you know naturally growing your your knowledge and then 
you're gradually sort of applying that knowledge to the things that you do. And then, you know, if you're a member of a community as well, you're obviously going to take the knowledge that you've learned and then try and sort of disseminate it and, and try and yeah. you know, give it, you know, pass it along. And you're, you're almost acting at first, like a sort of a relay of the information. And then you will naturally add your own originality to it, mm. which makes you, you know, then become, you know, somebody that actually has some sort of an influence uh, and and makes you a sort of original and an original uh, source of information. Yeah, and, and and you really are just like only the in you are just like a combination of all the people that influence you, all the people you've heard before, all the people that you've you know absorbed information from, and all of the things that have happened to you. You're you're a product of your experiences. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is like anyone's journey starts off like an empty vessel, even though you are taking that path yourself like you mentioned every little bit of advice input even negative experiences that happen to you along the way all get stored yeah. in that that container and then you know that that's i guess the total of what anyone anyone becomes yeah i mean it may be a cynical way to look at it is it, it may be as mostly the negative experiences that you know that can shape who you really are yeah uh, and that's something that's uh i think that that's definitely something that as i got older I definitely learned is true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like uh, a few years ago, I broke my ankle and I oh. definitely felt like that ta taught me a lot about, oh, you know, things can just change. Mm -hmm. Like one day you're walking around, everything's fine. And then the next day, oh, you're, you know, you're just, you're, you can't walk. Yeah. Well, you, how do you go to work? Oh, you can't go to work. You've got to, you got to stay here for, for three weeks, you know, while it heals. And then it's like, oh, well, you know, it changes everything. It's like, life can just throw a massive curveball at you sure. and and then you change what you value you change how you see the world and what you value and what uh what's really important to you becomes very clear when you're in some sort of situation that's uh that's like that um and i think that's why you know there's always always people that have these sort of near-death experiences and then they they you know they go and change their whole life radically afterwards mm -hmm. because they realize like this is a very you know, this isn't what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. I want to change uh, who I am. Uh, and 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 I think it, it's sort of like people are willing to do what they can to make it so that when they look in the mirror, they're happy with who they see. Mm. And I think that's always a, a thing that you need to be able to do. Yeah, You've got for to sure. Be to, um, to be able to live with yourself. 100%. And I think it's interesting, like, say, let's say you take a case study of, like, an individual that's lived a life from beginning to end. And mm -hmm. although we look at a person and recognize them and see that person with their name and what, what have you, mm -hmm. you know, like how many times has that person changed throughout their whole lifetime? Um, like even like say since, since a baby all the way through to even like say a 50 year old, mm -hmm. you've probably changed multiple times in significant yeah. ways. Um, where maybe you've like completely changed course and how you are in terms of how you approach things, how you um, process things and all that kind of stuff and your decision making. And it's interesting, like say, you know, like the concept of an individual, mm. what does that even mean when it, when it can constantly change? And like you mentioned as well, you know, like um, perhaps it is the negative experiences that we do tend to recognize the most purely because of, the impact they can have maybe we get too used to positive or the the ones that we expect to happen all the time and the ones that are negative are really a shock to the system um and i guess like maybe it's a survivability thing because even with kids um when they're younger they, they think everything's free and nothing's going to hurt them that when they first maybe burn themselves for the first time or cut themselves for the first time that's when they really start knowing their limitations and what's possible and, and what's, what's not possible i mean with art that's that's a hundred percent a metaphor that works with art because yeah. when you have a piece of work that you know my stuff that i put out when i was 17 i could you could give it to me now show it to me now and i could rip it to pieces yeah and there would be things that i would want to change i would look at oh that texture why is you know tile that more you know it's not got enough resolution it needs mm -hmm. you know these rocks here you should move those around you know and so on i could just go on for hours like that because there are all of these little details that I would put into it now and, you know, 
even big sweeping changes that I would make to you know things like the composition and and the lighting and and those are a result of years and years of showing my work to people and then them going well they, you know they scratch their beard and they go well it's uh it's okay it's okay but you need to do and then they go into the feedback and the feedback is you know sweeping changes or it's you know minor details or you know it depends on the level it's at mm -hmm. but it, it's definitely you know being in an environment where you get to hear negative feedback is going to propel you into being at a level where you can more easily work on your own yes because if, if you if you get to that point where you've had so much negative feedback about the kind of things that you're not doing right you can become as an individual artist you know as a freelancer or you know someone working on their own way 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 more powerful mm -hmm. uh the and and then of course you know even as good as you think you are working alone you will never be as good as you could be working in a studio because there you've got your work being looked at by a huge string of experts and they're going to you know the art director is going to look at your stuff and other artists are going to come around your desk and they're going to look at your stuff and then they're going to uh yeah I mean, th not rip it to pieces but in a nice way rip it to pieces mm -hmm. which is which is a good thing it's actually a good thing so it's it's really like you know yes it's a negative it's it's negative feedback but negative feedback is is good feedback yeah. um because you don't want to have a sort of uh echo chamber of sort of yes men around you uh that you know just tell you that oh this is perfect i, I mean, mean a great way, yeah a great way to do this nowadays is just post your work online and put it on youtube you know yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Find that everyone's everyone's ha there, there will be no uh <laughs> even if no it's problems. perfect you'll still get criticism on youtube Absolutely. Like yeah. all the other places, maybe a bit more tame now. It'll be like, great work, awesome, you know, a couple of emojis here and there. But YouTube, no, none of that. Oh, art, art stations, relatively, uh, you know, everyone's like, oh, awesome, dude. Yes, it's great, awesome, looks amazing, epic. But you know, you put it out to real normal people, and then yeah, you, you see what people say, and um, yeah, it, it'll just. It, what's interesting as well is that with normal people, they'll just be like, doesn't look that good. Mm -hmm. looks like a ps2 game yeah you know things like that right so they won't be necessarily like they won't necessarily have very nuanced criticism yes. they'll simply just say it looks bad yes the good thing about uh giving your work to other artists uh you know is is that you can basically get criticism that's targeted yes and um obviously you've been freelance now since you've um for a few years now a uh, couple of years now yeah a couple of years yeah um obviously you've been in a gaming environment almost daily for like close to a decade um and you mentioned obviously like feedback constantly um critiquing of the work obviously because it's like a project it needs to be taken you know to completion so that's why there's always these like feedbacks to make sure everything's corrected so you can get everything done properly um mm. since you've been freelance like, do you still seek that? Do you have like a network of people that you always feed things back to? Or do you have your own tools in place um, to replace that environment that you had at the um, in the game studio? Yeah, so I have a sort of network of close friends that, you know, when it's a piece that I really want to look really good, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll go to them and ask for critique. And it will just be, you know, and and, and it's not always that like, it's usually people that I've worked with in the past on, on projects before and that I, I trust yes. and, you know, I, I trust them to tell me whether or not something's really bad, yeah. you know, or, you know, it's not necessarily that they're going to give me tons and tons of their time and, and, you know, do a paint over for me or anything like that. I don't mm -hmm. expect that. Um, but you know, it's, it's just that, you know, so that I can gauge on what level the piece is at. Mm -hmm. And if it's like something abhorrent that I, I know that these are people that I trust that, you know, will give me, uh, a reasonably accurate idea of like you know it, what kind of quality it's touching on if it's if it's not quite there yet but i i, I just think that that's uh everyone should kind of try and grow their own little network for sure uh, yeah. of, you know, two or three people that they really trust that uh when they're trying to build you know when they've got that final render and they think it looks really really good okay now you send that over to your your buddy and, and see if if they're you know if it passes that sort of level of approval Mm -hmm. but yeah 
I mean, even if, like, say, you're completely at the top of your game and you know everything about the tools you're using, sometimes you just you can get that fatigue of just looking at your own or working on your own thing for a long period of time. And you just need to, like, even if you just take a day or two away yourself and then look back at it, um, that can always help. So obviously, it only makes sense that somebody else completely who don't who doesn't think the way you think and approach the things the way you uh, approach, having that different angle always helps. Um, and that's quite a common thread. Like a lot of pros have said that where it's, they like you mentioned, a, a very small but a very powerful network of people they trust, which is a key thing as well. Um, I, mean, I think you should, you know, send it to 10 people or something like that. Yeah, for, exactly. And just be a couple of people that you really trust and mm-hmm. you think, you know, that you value their opinion. Uh, and that you know will kind of give you the time to really give you an honest opinion. Yes. Um, and, and and I think that having this second pair of eyes is also the thing that's like, you know, so you don't, it's not just on a artistic or visual level, it's also so that you don't miss something that's obvious. Precisely, and important. yeah. Like, if, if there's just like, you know, something with your modeling that's like, oh, why didn't I think about that? Mm-hmm. Why is that there, you know? Um, that, you know, maybe there's there's just like, something really really obvious that you just totally miss because you are just lost in the details i mean it um, might be an extreme example but take places like say in aviation or even nasa it's like it's almost paramount to have two three four people checking mm-hmm. over something because it can make a difference of a successful mission or a complete disaster that can cost lives so yeah. again extreme example but if you can treat your work in the same way it only makes makes good I'm results glad. Glad that my artwork doesn't have to save any lives. <laughs> you never know. Um, there, there's an argument that potentially it could, um, depending on who's yeah. looking at it. But I know where you're coming from. So yeah, very, very glad. <laughs> so from a 17 year old who's working on passion projects, um, putting almost everything he has, especially um, you know, like your energy, um, your desire to want to make something the best it can be, um, and even just enjoying what you're using, to mm. almost today. Is kind of I guess the same thing like with Brushify what you're working on it's something mm-hmm. that you're passionate about something that you're putting all of your energy into yeah that gap in between um we're working on games and um perfecting your craft and working with other professionals like what would you say how has that affected the way you work because it's almost like it's like another cycle's begun um but with the same kind of like like habits and, and same kind of um uh, like like traits that are, that are continuing from before, but like what has changed since then? I think I mean it's very interesting question because I think what if I had, you know, when I was that sort of eighteen year old, seventeen year old, I had nothing like the equipment. I, you know, I wasn't equipped to build something like Brushify. I wasn't equipped to create a business. Um, you know, and I just think that it was. You know, there there had to be a string of different ideas that came along that, you know, made me think about, you know, both building a product, building the marketing for the product. How does this fit into an industry? How does this fit into this bigger ecosystem? Like these were all questions that had to have answers. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that there, I mean, obviously, infrastructure of unreal engine is you know is one of the things that makes brushify possible at all um so you know but but even if it wasn't you know that example even if it was something else like you know i know that you know in for instance in 2009 stock photography was really taking off and if you could go and you could buy sort of a canon rebel whatever it was back then uh, you know you go you go and you buy a a pretty decent but cheap dslr you could go and you could start taking stock photography and then you could start selling that online and you could back then make a really great, you could make a killing off of it, Mm -hmm. make a great business by doing that. Um, But you know, that just wasn't the thing that I did. It wasn't the thing I was interested in all that kind of stuff. But I imagine that even if it was as a 17 year old, I wouldn't have been equipped to, to build a business and I wouldn't have been equipped to work with, other companies i wouldn't have been equipped to work with other people i wouldn't have been able to take feedback on my stock photos i wouldn't have been able to you know uh, to work with other people and communicate and in order to actually build something that's commercially viable and i think that that's what working in a company can teach you is that it is there is a part of 
okay, yeah, at some point, maybe if after a few years working at the company, you can split off and do your own thing. But you definitely have to have some experience with getting feedback, working with people, getting the ideas from those people. Uh, and I think that generally most, I mean, not all the time, but most uh, teenagers don't suddenly have the idea to start their own business mm -hmm. because it's just too risky. It, it doesn't really make sense at that age. There's no real... Um, you know that there isn't uh sort of the foundation that's been laid for it mm -hmm. and, and and obviously that's you know there are exceptions to every rule and there's a very small number of of really really hyper successful entrepreneurs in their early 20s and you know they started their businesses when they were teenagers and mm -hmm. they're doing really well and they're much richer than we are probably <laughs> but you know that that's just the exception to the rule i think and mm -hmm. i but i do think that you know that's a, a sort of like uh, for the vast majority of people, I would definitely recommend trying to get to uh, a game studio, if, especially a reputable one, if they can do that in one or two steps. And then, you know, spending the time there, working with people, you know, getting feedback, working on many, many projects, working to deadlines, hmm. uh, because that's also something that, you know, you can't be spending, you know, if you don't have an idea about time, if you if you're like you know spending two weeks working on modeling a rock or something, you you're not going to be in this position where you're you're actually creating something that could you know make you some money because you're just going to be you know well you know you'll you'll be churning out you won't be churning out packs or or assets or free models or or stock photos or whatever it is you're selling you won't be churning them out you'll be just like you know procrastinating basically. Mm. Because uh, you don't have an idea about the timeline of you know how long things should really take, um, so I think like yeah, working in companies with other people, it will introduce you to you know it will introduce to you a sort of element of pressure. Yes. Yeah. And um, like with the with the tools you're developing now, mm. do you feel like this is your project? going forward now or do you have any other ideas um and avenues you want to branch out into going forward yeah i mean what what i'm actually working on now is that i'm gonna just i'll keep the brushify brand and yeah. i'm going to expand the mm. concept uh so that it includes you know it's sort of an umbrella term that includes more things mm. and, and really the, i think the cool thing about brushify as a brand is that uh it, it can really apply to anything it's you know if you've got a 3d model that's technically also a brush you know mm. and in, in fact in in cryengine it was even called you know you'd go into the brushes menu and you'd, you'd find all all the 3d objects in there mm. uh, because i mean that is really the the sort of technical term for a 3d model and now the way that you think about uh you know a paintbrush well, if you take that same concept of a paintbrush and you apply that to a real-time 3D engine, uh, then the brushes are essentially 3D models. Yes. And you know, alpha brushes and you know all of those all of those things for sculpting the terrain. But you know, even the meshes themselves, um, you can you can say are brushes. Uh, so even and and then in Brushify, the background mountains are also meshes that you can kind of rotate in place, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the you know ter playable terrain that you can you know sculpt. So. You know, all of that falls under brushes. So, when I expand the uh, the business outward to include things like uh, buildings and uh, you know maybe even props, eventually, uh, it's still going to all have that same umbrella name, Brushify. Mm. And I'm just going to just keep you know adding more to the library, basically. Nice. Before we jump onto the course, um, you yeah. touched upon a topic that I think is a lot on people's minds especially maybe um artists or people who just maybe i wouldn't say older but are starting to think about their own brand or how they can diversify um their careers and mm -hmm. but like a business so what was your because it's for some people that can be like you know it really excites them like i can't wait to start a business and do all these things but for a majority of people myself included it just mm. seems like a huge headache, a lot of things to take care of, a lot of, um, uh, I guess, quote unquote, paperwork, um, for lack of a better term. Just like all these things that seem not artistic, not not um, creative in any particular way, but at the same time, it's still appealing because there's an element of 
freedom behind it. So how mm. have you developed a business? Like what was that? What was that early stage for you like, and how has it been since? And do you have any tips for people who maybe want to start their own thing? Yeah. So I mean, I I pretty much because I started Brushify in Germany. Um, and the way that I structured the business is it's full digital storefront and it's mostly just done for Unreal Marketplace. So as far as the bureaucratic side of things goes, uh, really all that's necessary is that you pay your taxes. Mm -hmm. And and really that's the best thing I would advise for anyone who's worried about the bureaucratic side of things is to go to an accountant, get yourself a tax consultant, um, you know, obviously a reputable one mm -hmm. and just pay. You know, and that's really the thing that comes with, you know, uh, with business and with all of that kind of stuff is if you're not someone that wants to take on the responsibility of filing all the paperwork themselves, or you're worried you're going to, you know, going to mess it up or something, you know, get somebody who's really qualified in that stuff, get an accountant, get an advisor, uh, go to a proper, a legal firm. And, and if you tell them that, you know, you've got this really cool idea and that you, you want to, you know, start up this cool idea and you want to file your taxes and, you know, do I need to, do I, you know, can I operate the business as a freelancer? Can I operate, do I have to incorporate? Do I have to become a limited company? You know, or in, and it pretty much works the same in every country that, you know, your tax advisor will tell you what you need to be, you know, how you need to be structured. Um, and, and they'll, they'll give you the legal advice on that. Um, so I, I just, I would just say that if, if you're confident that you're going to be making uh, enough money doing it, um, you know, for for you know, if you're confident enough that you you think that you're actually going to be able to, you know, pay that whatever it is a year, and that, and it's usually something like a year or something like that, maybe a couple grand a year at most, mm -hmm. um, that you're going to be paying in legal uh, legal fees. Um, but I think that that's two grand well spent, to be mm -hmm. honest, for most people, uh, and it and for peace of mind. And reassurance that you've got a lawyer who's only a phone call away uh, that can, you know, kind of answer your problems and, and mm. walk you through and and kind of sort you out if if you know you're worried about something. Uh, I think it's worth it's worth doing it if you're going to start a business. Mm. Um, and and yeah, and and I think that a lot of a lot of those kind of like uh, I guess what is it pre mission jitters kind of thing. Mm. You know, this thing that you get before you start something. Um, a lot of it is psychological. And I think once the you know once the main pieces of bureaucracy are filed away, once you've you know registered as a freelancer, once you've you know registered uh, you know self-employed, and you've done all that side of things, and you've got into the swing of sort of you know the first year is always going to be difficult because you're going to have to like you know file um, you know things like VAT statements mm -hmm. every month, you know things like that. They're just very boring things. But you know, once you've got into the swing of doing it, um, you'll sort of find that actually the you know things get easier, and actually the bureaucracy gets less and less. Um, so yeah, it's it's just one of those things that you know is a bit of a hurdle, but you've just got to look at it like you know that's one half of it, and this allows me by taking on my fears, this allows me to basically you know live a life that's more like the life that I want to lead, mm -hmm. where I've got more freedom, I can uh, you know basically. Uh, work on the hours that I want to work. You know, I could work in the night if I want. I could work in the day if I want. Yeah. Uh, I can decide to just take a day off. Uh, you know, if if I feel stressed or something like that, um, I should probably do that at some point. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually do that many times. But yeah, it's you know, it's just that. Yeah, but that's just the kind of you know the kind of thing that uh, that just generally ends up happening. I, I think that people have this expectation that if they have complete freedom, they're not going to do any work. But mm. Uh, it's completely the opposite for me. You know, it's at the moment that I had more freedom. It was, you know, I'm my own worst boss, basically. <laughs> that's that's a bit of, you know, uh, a double-edged sword. But but yeah, I mean, um, I, I really don't think that the bureaucracy is something to be feared. And at the very, very worst case, even if you completely mess it up, uh, the very worst thing is that the government's going to come to you and say, you need to pay this. Mm. And then you pay it. So, I mean, I don't know why, you know, unless you're doing something that's outwardly, you know, uh, illegal or something, mm -hmm. you don't have anything to worry about. Um, you you really need to just get over that psychological fear and uh, get the right team together, yeah. uh, get in touch with the right people. And, uh, and yeah, and then you, you'll, uh, you'll definitely, um, you'll definitely, I think, reap the benefits of it. 
So reap the rewards, sorry. So when you first began um, your business, like, were you going for those jitters yourself or was it, um, were you completely like sure of this is the way to go forward? Um, I mean, I, I, I was quite lucky because I needed to file as a, you know, do all the paperwork for being a freelancer anyway. Right. And then, you know, then I started to put up all of the like, you know, products and things. And, you know, it, it, at some point it was basically like, oh, I probably need to, you know, I, I think I'd already told my lawyer I'm probably going to be selling some digital products and things. Yeah. And then, and then they were like, yeah, that's fine. You know, it's all good. And then, and, you know, then, then they're in this position where they're like, well, you know, at this point you can, you know, you can, uh, you, you might be reclassified as something else. And then if that happens, then you do this, but there's no, like, it, it's kind of like a gray area, mm-hmm. you know, whether or not, you know, you get audited or reclassified on tax, you know, but once you've filed and, and sort of explained to the government that you're doing a freelance thing, then they kind of class you self-employed and then you're paying income tax. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've just got to put it that way. As long as you're, you know, doing everything you're legally meant to be doing, you're paying your taxes, you're paying your own health insurance and you've set that kind of system up. Once you've got that set up, um, it's, it's almost, you know, it's, it's almost automated at that point. Um, and there's not very much to worry about. It's, it's almost just like your, your, your own HR department. Yeah you know doing you know with one employee and and i i definitely you know think that like okay if you're going to scale the business and have multiple employees and start hiring people of course then things will get much more complex mm-hmm. i've tried to keep mine it's, i'm still a one-man band mm-hmm. and you know i've tried to keep my thing as as streamlined as possible um and you know produce as much value as i can as one person um but, you know, and I, and I definitely think that, you know, I recommend doing that first before mm. going into the next step. And, and, you know, at this point I'm, you know, I have been kind of, you know, thinking about the next step, thinking about whether I want to do that. Um, but at the moment I, I, I kind of feel like the, the pro, you know, the pros outweigh the cons kind of thing of, of being, uh, solo. So yeah, we'll see. Nice. It's interesting. And as a creative, as an artist, how mm. has it affected your art in any way and your approach to creativity? Or has that maintained, or has that stayed the same? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's really changed anything. Mm. I think it's just sort of, um, yeah, it, it's it's just got to the point where it's, it, well, I, I don't know. I, I think for some reason I've always had this grander, bigger vision for what Brushify could be. Mm-hmm. And I think that, in general, it's like I'm just kind of following this, you know, you know, it's kind of like a general skeleton layout of what it, what I want it to be in mm-hmm. two years' time, right? What packs do I want available on the Unreal Marketplace? Uh, you know, when Unreal Engine Five comes out, mm-hmm. what will things look like then? How should things be, and how, you know, how will I announce that I've, you know, made these upgrades to, you know, make make it all work with Unreal Engine Five? Yeah. And, and, all these new packs out as well and this is like you know so it's like there's this kind of uh you know roadmap that's you know partly in my head partly written down you know a bit of both basically and it's very flexible so i just get to choose which piece of the puzzle i work on next and then and then focus on that really um actually a question that's come up with that you just said um and something that i've noticed um whilst going through the course is mm-hmm. you you talk about um i think it's in um lesson two where you you speak about how to get everything done um and not to let it become overwhelming Mm. and obviously just mentioned about you're thinking like you know a few years in a few years ahead now like Mm. how are you someone who meticulously plans things or like what's your process regarding planning and structuring the way you work and your projects etc like is that something you because there's like some people who rely heavily on planning and setting a timetable and getting things done and there's others who are just kind of like um it's like playing a first person shooting you got a zombie wave and you just keep get mm-hmm. killing everything that comes in your way until the till the till the project's done well i i mean i i would also say that that falls into you know my original thing which was cinematics yeah and writing scripts and i was always somebody that was like 
appalled whenever we didn't write a script and we ended mm. up trashing half the shots that took ages to work on and you know or, or something like that kind of situation where what you know it just happens it with with some productions it's like you know some productions go really smoothly mm. and other productions don't and i would say that in general the productions that go smoothly are the ones that are well plans that have scripts the mm. ones that where people you know directors stick to the script and don't try and change the script halfway through the project mm -hmm. um and you know the problem is that obviously like if you're working a you know a cinematic department that's also like you know kind of coinciding with a bigger project like a game and the game is changing then your cinematics have to change and so yeah. on so it makes it much harder but with something that's yours and that you fully creatively control you know like me with brushify i don't have an excuse mm. i don't have Somebody else that's coming in and telling me that oh we, we've got we've changed the lighting in this level now so you need to re-render your entire cinematic it, at night uh, you know so nothing like that that's going to happen right it's all on me to basically plan the content of you know what i'm going to deliver what my pack's going to in include and and make sure that i you know hit all those bullet points um but i wouldn't say that i go into sort of like meticulous detail with mm -hmm. the planning they are brush strokes and mm. yeah, they're sort of flexible, but I definitely like to tick the boxes. That's for sure. Cool. Right. So Unreal Environment, your Learn Squared course, which um, is still a few weeks away at the time of recording, but um, whoever's listening to this now, um, the course will be out because we'll release this when the course is out. How you mentioned before we started recording the podcast, like what it means for you and what you hope for it to be um if you'd like to go over that again that would be great for the listeners yeah yeah i mean this is one that i mean yeah when i first started to work on it um i we you know we sort of planned out the sort of yeah just like i was talking about before you know this sort of mm -hmm. overview the sort of skeleton of all of the bullet points that the course would cover and yeah i i you know we definitely went very grandiose with the planning of it um because it pretty covers you know almost every aspect of creating a render uh, you know an environment render in unreal and you know everything that you need to do uh, in order to actually create some sort of finished real-time terrain that you can actually run around in and sort of play in um and i you know i've done youtube videos uh, lots and lots of youtube videos in the past where i've got sort of like you know two hours of me like kind of noodling around in the editor mm -hmm. and then you know kicking out an artwork but the difference with you know with that which is more of a sort of like you know it's just me kind of spending a couple of hours doing something but not really fully explaining and going into the details in this course it's really that i go into the detail of every little aspect of how to do something mm -hmm. you know, so i will go into how to paint the alpha brushes what's the best way to paint them you know, I'll go into how to procedurally generate the foliage, how to basically, you know, change the distributions of that stuff, um, where all the menus are, how you can get to them, uh, and and generally just like how you can use some of the the techniques, you know, these sort of basic artistic techniques like mm -hmm. composition and lighting and uh, you know that sort of theory uh, to build your scenes. So I, I and I don't think that on any of my YouTube stuff, the stuff I've got so for free on YouTube, I don't think I've ever gone into this level of depth. Mm -hmm. And I think this whole course is, I think it's eleven hours or twelve hours of stuff. It's some some huge number of hours. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also what what you maybe don't realize as well is that uh, what I actually recorded initially for the course is probably tens of hours hmm. it's probably something like maybe 30 or 40 hours and then it's you know it's edited down you know and, and made very very concise and you know i personally edited it all myself uh to make it as sort of streamlined as possible hmm. and as concise as possible so there's very little fluff in there uh there's very few sort of ums and ahs and that sort of typical hmm. thing that you get with, with some instructors where you know they're not really flowing and they're not sort of you know uh, you know always 100% explaining what they're actually doing and mm. what's really happening so it it is a click by click uh showing from start to finish of you know 
how the actual tool works and uh, and what's really uh, what really are the things that you need to do uh, to get to a piece of art that's on this sort of level. And we've got it structured into uh, four lessons. Obviously, with all of our courses, the the first lesson's free, um, so everyone gets access to that once they sign up, and that's effectively. I guess understanding how Unreal works, figuring your way around it, getting familiar with it, um, and like from the from the looks of it, from, from my perspective, is it doesn't look like an intimidating piece of software to get into. Um, I know you mentioned that before early on, like how how they've built it, how they've structured it. It's something that is is um, accessible and designed for someone to be able to just pick it up and uh, and, and start learning it. Um, but like, is there anything in particular, especially for people who are perhaps, because we always get like two types of students, ones that are, have this on their radar and they really want to learn it and maybe they're already in that field. And then mm-hmm. others who, and that's probably the angle I'm coming from, is where, okay, this tool looks like I can implement this with the way I work, but not necessarily um, have the mindset of someone who works in real-time engines. So is there anything in particular that... Um, people should brush up on or have a have a um, like a like a basic knowledge of to get going in the course or um would you say that it's you can get hit the ground running straight away um from lesson one without having needing anything else prior to that yeah i mean i think that i i tried as as best as i possibly could to create a sort of mini introduction to unreal engine 4 mm. within the course itself so you know, obviously, it would be great if you already had some Unreal Engine 4 knowledge, and you know, if you've maybe picked up the, you know, the engine and tried to do the, you know, the basic navigation and stuff like that. But even things like the, you know, understanding the basic navigation and understanding a bit of the UI, that stuff is covered as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there is a sort of like, you know, an onboarding section at the beginning where, you know, it's more about the sort of the theory behind, you know, working in real time and, you know, the basics of you know, even just how to move the camera around, mm. because I think that's that's one of the the things that can be a stumbling block, especially from people that are coming from, you know, 3D Studio Max or Maya or, you know, those kind of backgrounds, uh, you know, or even like CAD applications, you know, where they're just, you know, they're not used to the way that the camera moves mm. in, uh, in the Unreal Engine. Uh, and that's because the the actual control system is taken from video games. So it's taken from a first person shooter. So the moment you right click to kind of look around, you've then got the the W A S and D keys that you're you know basically it's almost like playing Quake Three mm-hmm. uh, or Half Life or something. Um, whereas you know normally you'd have sort of an orbit camera and you know things would be done very differently. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so there's certainly like that whole sort of very very beginner basics baby steps at the very beginning that you know it's more about talking about the sort of tactics that we're going to be using. Uh, you know, and the planning that we're going to be using to put together an artwork um, and, and you know, just the basics of how to actually start using the engine. And, you know, the, in the first lesson, it's it's really just more like building a sort of asset zoo. Yeah. And that's really about sort of kind of gathering the assets from all the multiple different sources, you know, whether it's assets from Brushify, um, which, by the way, you get some included assets mm-hmm. from Brushify uh, in some, you know, two different example projects. Um, and, or if you know if you want to go onto Quicksol and you know they, all their library is free for Unreal Engine users, yeah. so you can go and grab some stuff from Quicksol as well. And then you know the first uh, the first uh, lesson is more about just basically using um, what we call the brief builder to come up with a concept of your own, a sort of idea of your own, and then building an asset zoo around that concept. So you know. I'm building in in the the actual course. I'm I'm building the sort of screenshots that you see in the promotional stuff, which yeah. is a sort of, uh, a kind of city in a sort of natural landscape and you know a sort of rooftop bar in mm-hmm. that city and so on. But you know you can you can actually take the the course and direction of the course in your own direction, and you know you could be building a sort of an ancient Rome with a Colosseum in the background. Mm-hmm. A nice natural landscape in front of that that's you know something completely different or you could be build, building a sort of arabic style city in the desert or you know medieval city or it could be anything that you imagine and and you've got to kind of 
repurpose and 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 take the the direction that I'm giving you and 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 apply that to your own idea mm. and you know build your your from starting from your asset zoo and then you know going forward and and actually taking that and and creating and fleshing out a, a full visual concept from it. Yeah, and I think that's like what I like about it is because let's say uh, again from my angle, like say as a concept artist. Is that you can go into, um, I guess what the term is, an offline renderer, right? Um, mm-hmm. Where you can like, jump into Octane or V-Ray, or what have you. Really mm-hmm. tweak it, make it look super awesome, super realistic if you want to go go that way and just place things how you want to place them. Um, but then the way you see, especially with the, the environments you've built in this course, like they, they do look amazing. And what I really like about it, and you explain it like with how LUDs work and how they, they load when you get like, they get high res when you get closer to the camera and obviously they fade away when you're further back. Like you see the details in the grass and obviously you see it move, you see the physics behind it as well. Mm. And then then like from an angle of like say a concept artist, I'm thinking, you know, th- this is awesome. Like I can just, because I, I do a lot of 3D, I work with a lot of 3D assets myself anyway. So it, it seems very accessible just to plunk my say vehicles or what have you in there and then, then structure the environment around it and then just pick my shot and the cool thing about it is is like whereas usually i'd have to figure out say a certain angle and just mm. just build things behind the camera just so it looks how i want it to look whereas here it's an actual movable environment that looks perfect in every way you look at it so then you can just spend that time like you mentioned before thinking like a photographer or a cinematographer and really get the shots or just a shot you you, you want um, and like I think lesson two um, goes on to more the natural environments, right? Yeah, exactly. So once once you've kind of solidified your you know your basic understanding of the engine in lesson one, and you've built your little asset zoo, it's then about how you take those assets and apply them. Uh, you know how you build a landscape of your of your own. Mm. How you start sort of placing rocks down. How you start placing trees down. Uh, you know, adding things like water. Uh, and you know, beginning to kind of play with lighting and and sort of understand how you know how you can get a basic you know landscape together and get to that point where not that not just that you're building one landscape, it's that point where you're doing the exercises and the exercises will allow you to kick out very 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 quickly yes. lots and lots and lots of prototype landscapes. And I think the cool thing with that is that you'll find that as you do the exercises. Uh, you know, you'll get to this point where uh, what used to take, you know, may, you know, it maybe takes you an hour the first time you try and make a landscape. But if you you know, keep repeating uh, the same process, uh, you know, through the exercises, you'll eventually get to the point where a landscape uh, can be done in in under ten minutes, wow. or you know, maybe even five minutes. And and it's really just like there are so many exercises throughout the the lesson that you know, eventually by the end of it. Whether you want to or not, uh, you'll have reached a point where your speed has definitely increased. Yeah, and um, I think that's that's a good point. It's like, on one hand, um, it's you can look at it say as a creative and thinking this is a cool tool to learn because of the advantages it has. And I really like. I think you explained it in the course as well. We describe it as like painting in Photoshop, but it's not exactly Photoshop. You're doing it in a real time environment, um, especially where you can just like a couple of clicks. You've got an ocean or a lake and then you can just add all these objects and what have you um to like like a look of exactly how you want it um but then you just mentioned it there is like it's not just also about another way of working it's the the production benefits of it of how quickly it can take you and also the reusability like like you mentioned an hour to set it up but then within minutes you can kick out all of these and obviously if you're professional you need to get a lot of visuals out or whatever things you need um like they mentioned time is money and even not even just like an, an as like time is money but just time to actually you can use that extra time to really refine your project to make it look awesome and as a tool this looks really powerful in that regard as well like yeah i, yeah, I think project, that yeah. as well it's this it's this great thing where once you get quick at iterating uh, you know, you're then in this position where, you know, if somebody comes to you for an Unreal Engine project, uh, you know, say, I, I need you to build me a, a 16 square kilometer map 
uh, it's got to be a level that looks like this and and you know they give you a sort of like a blueprint for how things should look and where things should be placed that you're going to be in this, this position where you can you know you can kick that out in a few days whereas you know somebody else they would have to you know grab a bunch of random different you know stuff from marketplace and they're not really sure how it works and how it's done whereas with this it's that you know I'm teaching Unreal Engine, but I'm also teaching, you know, really how you can use the Brushify stuff to get mm. the most out of Unreal. Um, and because it's all as one system, uh, it's, you know, everything you need is included. Mm. So it's really just like, you know, and I also, you know, there are there are plugins as well that I use in unison with it, like uh, Hemisphere Skies, for instance, uh, you know, that, that really help with the lighting and, mm. and get sort of, you know, these time-lapse effects that... Uh, you know that look really cool so it's sort of like you know but but for the most part everything is is included and it's all sort of like one holistic system um, so with, with like um brushify because what i've noticed is how you explain exactly what you're doing and how it can affect you but even just like looking at it like you can especially like with the trailer that we'll be kicking out and even just looking at some of the, the promotional stuff just even watching it on mute you can just see what like brushify can do for you and how it looks and and how it can really affect how you work. Let's say you were to take that out of it. Like, how would you be able to get that same effect by yourself? And like, how difficult would it be, or how much work is needed um, to match up to what Brushify can offer you, which it literally does in like a couple of clicks or brushstrokes? Yeah, I mean, I think I think if you were trying to start completely from scratch and build it yourself, um, you definitely have to take a month and do the programming work. And I think it would take you, yeah. I mean, it's just it's just one of those things where you would end up having to go and uh, you know basically do the work from scratch of building your own auto material, and and then you know you you're basically at this point where you know you've got to think about all of the all of the stuff that goes into that. But so for instance, the way that Brushify is structured, you know, it's taken sort of two years for me to kind of find an optimum way mm. that allows people to use the system you know because it's it's got to be flexible so that people can actually use it it's got to be something that people can easily add more components to and then take away components that they don't need and sort of all of that stuff is is sort of well thought through mm -hmm. um, so you know if you don't have that you've got to kind of come up with all that stuff yourself and yes it it might be that you can create a bespoke thing that is you know that works for you um but there's something to be said definitely for a sort of one size fits all solution um, that you can just take something that already looks good and then tweak it for your own project. And um, yeah, and, and I think that, you know, it's there are a lot of things in there that are just uh, they would they would definitely take a very long amount of time to develop. Uh, and, and especially also from from asset side of things as well. You know, it's just tons of time processing, uh, processing assets, especially things like foliage. Mm. Um, which you know, if you even if you go on the Unreal Marketplace, um, you might download some foliage, but you'll also find that you know maybe they don't have uh, all the necessary LODs. Maybe the person that created it didn't really think about performance. Um, at the end of the day, anyone is allowed to sell something on Marketplace, mm. uh, so the quality can be it can be really really good, and there are some really professional sellers on there. Um, but also, you know, you can you can end up with something that looks really good in the screenshots. Uh, on the page and then you get it and it's uh it, it runs it mm. you know five frames per second um so you know i think that's the the kind of benefit that you're getting with with brushify is that everything is pre-optimized not going to be a situation where you end up with a super low frame rate unless you're doing something you know completely crazy like turning off the lods or you know th something like that but yeah um yeah, I definitely think there are, there are huge benefits to it. I mean, straight away, how it how it looks like it's implemented and how you use it, it does look. And I mentioned this earlier as well. Like it's it's very artist friendly, which is very welcome because a lot of the time, especially when it's like say you just want to you have an idea, you want to quickly get it out as soon as possible, and having to fiddle with things and tweak things. Um, although that is necessary at times, um, like in other softwares, for example, it, it does it can like make the idea not as potent as it possibly could be. Mm. So with this, you can just get it out there. And even like, say just from like an angle of um, 
like say a concept artist just even just getting it like making it so it's like a silhouette perhaps and you got a certain look how you want to get it take a screenshot and then taking the photoshop and do any kind of paint overs you need to um but i think that the beauty of it is and we mentioned this before it like it is accessible and it can be an advantage to many different kind of disciplines and industries um and i think with a course it does allow you to even when you take it you can still apply it to all these different things as well um like very much like in lesson three where obviously lesson two is more natural environments and you show things like how you put a road in there um obviously hills and all that kind of stuff even with lighting adding water and then the next one is pretty much like a very city environment almost the complete opposite um but again the approach is or the the ease of getting it out there is also the same as well um like how much thought was put into making sure that all these different like the, the diverse worlds you can build are made as easy as all of them like the not a case of like okay doing that kind of world is more difficult than the other one was that a lot of work required to make sure that was as easy as possible for the artist yeah so i mean it's it's really about the sort of tactics that you use and and i think that what's great about unreal is that there are so many different tools in there that you can mm. you know build on top of so you know for instance with the with the auto material um you know that you've got a problem there which is that okay you've got terrain well okay but the problem is that you know i need to go into world machine and i need to generate this terrain and that's going to take me ages mm -hmm. and then i you know i've got to figure out a way to import that into unreal engine and then once it's imported it's just this block that's imported and then i well i've no way to edit it in the engine what if i need it to be that this mountain you know what if i need to move that mountain what if i need to you know create a path up the side of that mountain what if i need to you know change things it becomes very, very difficult when you've just generated this terrain. Mm -hmm. So the great thing about using, you know, the alpha brushes and the auto material in combination with each other is that you can just sculpt a mountain right mm -hmm. there, just as if it was Z brush or something like that. You can sculpt that directly onto the landscape and then immediately you can run up that mountain and the whole thing will be textured by the auto material. And so that that's sort of like the system that I'd built uh, you know, using the Unreal Engine visual coding tools, which are basically it's the shader graph, um, which is a form of, it's almost like blueprint. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and sort of like I built that system around that for natural environments. Uh, when I moved across to working on um, uh, basically hard surface environments and, you know, basically creating cities and, and city blocks and that kind of stuff, uh, I had to utilize a completely different system, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, basically prefabricated blueprints and the great thing was that yeah again unreal engine is just super flexible with this which is that it allows you to basically uh create these prefabricated blueprints containers of all of these objects that you can edit and the awesome thing about them is that it's not just that you can create these sort of groups of objects you can have groups within groups within mm. groups so you know you can you can work on a building and you can, you know, create a building in lots of modular sections with different floors. And then you can, you know, you know, add all of these sort of decorations and embellishments like, you know, fire escapes and air conditioners on the sides and, you know, rooftops with these little rooftop huts and mm -hmm. uh, all of the things that make a building look really realistic. And then you can take that entire prefab and then you can uh, bring that and make that uh, an entire city block of all these prefabs sort of together combined. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's sort of like that idea of blueprints within blueprints that mm. is such a powerful thing. And and the great thing is that if you change a blueprint, you know, one blueprint at its source, uh, it will then actually uh, propagate across the entire system. So all of those blueprints, you know, if you if you decide to change one building and you decide I'm going to kill one of the floors, I'm going to get rid of that floor, mm. I'm going to make these buildings all shorter then every single instance of that building in your entire city will immediately get that change mm. once you hit save. So yeah, it's it's just a you know it's a different system but it's it's also one that's very, very powerful and one that I decided to utilize for the city stuff. And like say cuz obviously you you're very familiar with game engines and you're very familiar with how to get the most out of them and also um how to not exploit the limitations as well um just to make sure everything is running smoothly like how crazy could you or how have you gone 
like in Unreal Engine and using Brushify and, and your workflow, like how extravagant have your, I guess your worlds become? Like how far have you pushed it? I mean, I'd say at the moment, um, it can handle a 64 square kilometer map pretty well. Mm. Um, and and you, there have been, you know, maps that I've done where I've just gone completely crazy, covered them all in trees, mm-hmm. you know, covered them in, in, in cities. But, but I would say that this is the thing. It's sort of like, um, uh, in terms of, in terms of like objects, I don't think you really can run into too many limits there. I really think that, you know, the LODs will take care of the vast majority of it. Right. So as long as you're not going absolutely insane with sort of density of objects, sort of needless density, yeah. um, generally it's okay. And, you know, as long as, as long as you, as long as you sort of like keep an eye on the, the basics like poly count you know shader overdraw mm. uh draw calls there are always you know these list this sort of checklist of performance uh meters that you need to sort of look into uh, and you know and that's all depending on on your gpu mm. so if you have a more powerful gpu you know for instance i'm i'm still working with a gtx 1080 ti i didn't mm. upgrade to the 2080 ti because i thought uh i don't know i just uh, didn't like the price i didn't mm. think it was a big enough leap in performance really yep. and i'm very happy with my my gtx 1080 that's mm. running really nice and quiet so i was like you know it, it's one of those things where it's just like it's a it's a, a gp i've been using for three years or you know, two or three years i know what it can do i know how many draw calls it can take i know how much you know what poly count it can take and i've just been kind of like you know almost gambling on the fact that it's not really much of a gamble yeah. that you know basically this gpu is going to get completely outclassed and it absolutely has been mm-hmm. you know so so now we've got gpus coming out that are two maybe three times more powerful yeah. than this one and you know when when you look at a flagship gpu like you know that was as prolific as the 1080 ti yeah you know you think oh my god but it, it's running on a 1080 ti well that that's crazy it must be that it, it's really difficult to run mm-hmm. But you know that that's the thing is if you if you're thinking a few years ahead, um, you know suddenly the Lux card that's coming out, you know, for for like five hundred bucks mm-hmm. has now doubled the speed of this one. No, so no. I think it's it's almost like something you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, too much. You definitely need to understand the GPU that you're working with at the current time, yeah, and keep an eye on those optimization basics: poly count, draw calls, shader overdraw. Mm-hmm. And and that's something that I teach as well in the course, uh, which is a sort of the, you know touching on the basics of optimization, mm. where you need to go to you know sort of optimize your poly count, where you need to go to optimize the draw calls, the shader of a draw. Um, we even look at the texture memory as well, um, and you know check out which textures are using the most texture memory, uh, and and also just giving a kind of general idea about how a real time engine works, mm. because. I think not a lot of people understand, you know, some of the these ideas that once you've loaded an object uh, once and its texture, that texture is then loaded into GPU memory, and that means that that texture essentially becomes free. Mm. So, you know, if you've loaded that 4K texture one time, that's done. You you can use that on any object you like in the scene because it's mm. already loaded by the GPU. Um, obviously more objects that use it going to use more draw calls and so on like that but you know th- this is stuff that i'm explaining in the course hmm. and it, it basically explain you know it explains the way that you can create scenes in a very uh yeah in, in a very cheap and optimized way that's kind of leaning into uh the limitations of a real-time engine and kind of understanding what those limitations are in order to exploit those limitations to make scenes that look super complicated, mm-hmm. but in fact uh, can all you know can run very easily in real time. I mean, um, just to recall what you said earlier, um, the Rebirth project you can run on a 1080 Ti, right? Or well, you did yeah. work on that one, so yeah. And that says, you know, like visually, um, it's as beautiful as you're going to get in terms of like forget like the fact that it's real time and how it was made. It just looks amazing. So the fact that it was made in real time and not unlike you mentioned, where supercomputer um, should be appealing to anybody who wants to emulate or even make something on that level. And that brings us, I guess, to the final lesson, which is lesson four, where I guess it's bringing it all together, polishing it, making it look um, as good as it can be. And like, how important is that process for you? And um, how much like 
importance is that? Um, like how much, how important is that for people to really spend time on really polishing and getting the most out of the project that they work so hard on? Yeah. So, I mean, sort of lessons one, two, and three is it's more this kind of focus on quick iteration and mm. sort of prototyping and, and kind of getting people up to speed so that they can, you know, bang out these environments relatively quickly. Mm. Uh, but yeah, lesson four is, is really the point where we say, okay, now you've got to pick one of these sort of shots that you've been working on and now you've got to take that and try to make that into something that's somewhat like a portfolio piece mm -hmm. and it's going into this whole um you know yes you've sort of planned this shot already and yes you maybe you have some lighting that you think looks okay and maybe you've done some set dressing on it but now we're going into the the fine detail as in you know taking huge blown up screenshots of your work and then zooming into you know the the tiny little details like the little pebbles and then analyzing those details and going well why doesn't that look real you know what could we do here to make this little bit of dead space look more realistic going into like what where to add noise and where to remove noise in order to make something more visually appealing because you can also get a photo that's actually just an ugly photo Mm -hmm. um so th that that really goes into then you know this idea of and ideas about maximalism and minimalism mm -hmm. and understanding the fine balance between the two um and i think that's like uh, yeah it's a super important part of the creation process uh and then of course you know there's also in the final lesson the more technical aspects as well as the artistic ones mm -hmm. which are you know just you know how do you actually render this stuff um especially in batch, especially in like a, a larger resolution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do I actually get to the point where I can present these uh, pieces of artwork to people? Um, what if I want to, for instance, compile an executable and actually have that run real time in some presentation or something? Um, so even stuff like that is covered as well. Um, so yeah, I think I think that, yeah, it's uh, it's a super crucial part that, you know, not just that you've actually worked on a piece of artwork, and that you're proud of how it visually looks it's also the part where you've got to render it out showcase it in its best light and sort of understand that that wrapping it all up and putting the sort of cherry on the cake is uh is a really necessary part of the process as well and like i guess for me looking at the course as, as a whole is first and foremost is that i can just envisage like once i've grasped everything to mm -hmm like the possibility is endless you can make any kind of like environment you want any kind of world you want any kind of like again whatever you need you can make it i guess the key that's the key thing as well it's not a case yeah. of okay i'm unlimited to this this kind of look this kind of aesthetic and i can make it it's a case of whatever you need you can make it and that's probably the most important thing um as a creative you can you can get to be able yeah. to do what you want um but also the way it's structured the way you teach it it is you're in, you're in great hands because it's well taught well explained obviously like you said you put a lot of effort into making sure that the message comes across properly and um from anything from like just ideation phase to being able to understand um what you can get out of the the software and also how to make sure that it's it comes out great it comes out amazing um it's a workflow that you, I can clearly see a lot of people take forward and, and make amazing things from it. So my question to you is, like, is there any particular, and it's a very rhetorical question, so I might not even have an answer to it anyway, uh, but like, is there any key thing you'd love to see students take away from the course or you'd love to see them do um, that would really make you feel like, okay, that, that that's great. You've definitely taken on board what's been taught and you're really making it your own. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd really love to see, you know, obviously it's like, it would be great to see this sort of badass artwork mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, people that have really gone the extra mile to creating these very detailed scenes, these very, you know, scenes that are well lit. That will be, a you know, definitely something that would be really cool to see. But, you know, what I'm especially excited to see would be, you know, students that really take a very creative approach and, you know, leave the subject matter that, I've, you know, you know, maybe, maybe that they, they work on, you know, something similar to, to what I'm doing at first, but mm -hmm. then they maybe go through the course again and they decide, okay, I'm going to do something really crazy this time. What if I make, you know, what if I grab some, 
uh, you know, what if I model some buildings myself and, and build like a crazy science fiction city? Or mm -hmm. what if I, you know, create, you know, some, some really awesome, uh, medieval, uh, uh medieval, uh, background, you know, like a big castle or something like that, you know, and, and that's stuff that can fit into uh, a landscape. You know, there's also the possibility as well to, you know, to copy movies and stuff, mm. um, which, you know, obviously with this course, is, it's not like aimed at any particular movie or anything like that, because I, I try to keep things as generic as possible. Mm -hmm. But in terms of fan art, you know, there, there are really cool things you could do there, um, in, you know, just in terms of like, if you want to put your, you know, superhero character looking like a complete badass in the mm. city or something, um, you know, that's, you're totally you know, able to do that. Uh, and I think in the last, um, in the last Brushify video I did, I actually had a few little shots of Spider-Man leaping around in the, the city. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, it just like, it, it was really cool because it, you know, caught a few eyes and stuff and made, made people realize like, oh, wow. You know, so, so, you know, that was just like some guy that had basically programmed all the gameplay for Spider-Man in UE4 and he was offering it as like a free download for everyone yeah. on YouTube. And so, you know, it was just like, I just grabbed his files, uh, you know, it was all in Unreal Engine already, all working out of the box. Mm -hmm. And I just threw that directly into the Brushify Urban Buildings pack. And I was suddenly swinging around as Spider-Man. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's the really cool thing about Unreal, because this is all one ecosystem. Uh, you can get a model, you can get a project that someone's already imported. Uh, you know, you can buy something from Unreal Marketplace. And then you can just put that immediately into your environment. Mm. You know, if you want to create uh, an environment using this course, and then you want to create your own little Call of Duty first person shooter game, mm -hmm. you can do that within, you know, only a couple of days or something. Mm. You know, once you've got that piece of, of environment done, once you've got that piece of artwork done, it's a playable thing that you can then take to the next level. Uh, so I think that will be really exciting to see, you know, just how far people can push it. Uh, and you know how creative they can be yeah i think that's the key thing as well is like you can look at it in multiple ways like say you know like i mentioned before it's a case of oh, i'm looking for a certain shot and just get that and that's it but like you said it's playable so that means it's in, you know you can interact with it and it really does make the possibilities endless um and it also ties back into what you mentioned like you mentioned the course as well, like your beginnings and how you got into um making but well, working in games because you started making your own levels right with them what games that had a level editor crisis yeah uh, and yeah before that far cry a little bit yeah but yeah mostly crisis was when i really got serious about it and you know it started to become something uh that i thought like yeah this is something really cool uh, and, and that you know i wanted to do from that point then fast forward to now and with this mm. course it's like look look at what's become of it just from that like I guess that intrigue that you had and that, that appeal that you had to you and just you put in, you know, all of your energy into it and getting a lot of enjoyment out of it as well. Like it just, it's quite inspiring to see what could come out of that. Like, I guess that honest energy, um, you know, if you will. And yeah. And I, I think it's also cool because it's sort of like, you know, there are, it, it's been interesting for me because I think that, you know, getting to the point where I've got all of these things to play with now, are kind of you know it's kind of necessary because i i can now play with them myself mm. so you know i'm excited by what i've already got i'm excited by the fact that you know i've got all of these packs they're all on marketplace I, at any time i can go and i can grab you know a, a desert dune scene or a mountain scene or or you know snowy mountains or desert mountains or grasslands or moorlands mm -hmm. uh, even the moon you know i can grab those scenes and i can do something creative with those scenes really really quickly i can put spider-man in in my city yeah. and i can just you know go crazy with it so it's like you know th there are so many um you know possibilities to this and and that, what's crazy for me is that i haven't because i've been working on this for so long mm. i haven't had the, the sort of opportunity myself to to go there and do the creative mm. stuff uh, and i think that that's the thing is that there's only really one of me so what's mm -hmm. really cool about this course is it's kind of like um you know, it's kind of like seeding this sort of, you know, idea into hope, hopefully this is my hope, hope for it is that it, it kind of gives this idea uh, to the students and that then, you know, other people can take this and really run with it and, and do their own creative things. Mm -hmm.
um and that's going to be really cool to see you know um you know especially just like and, and I, I i'm a real fan of lots of different you know kind of subject matters and stuff i love medieval stuff i love mm. roman stuff i love aliens and sci-fi and and dragons and yeah you know so it's just and and once you've got those environments that are the perfect backdrop uh to those sort of things um then you know the possibilities are endless right mm. i think that's a great um point to wrap up the podcast on um and yeah i'm really excited for just even taking the course myself because i can see the benefits that's going to benefit my workflow but even just seeing like what the community is going to be doing with it i mean we've only started promoting it a little bit um so far this week and already we're getting requests of like people asking like wanting more information on the course and this has been a requested like a most requested course for quite a while now so you can really see people hyped up and you're just chomping at the bit ready to get going and i know a few people that are working on their own like say ips and i can just see this really help enable them to take that to another level as well um and to anyone listening um if you're listening right now um once this podcast has aired then the course is out right now and we always launched the course with an early bird discount so now is a good chance to get it at obviously a great price um before it goes back up to its original price um but also if you just want to get a taste of the course and thinking like if you're still on the fence of whether it's for you or not um we we also offer the first lesson for free um so you can still get a taste of the course and even get some great knowledge um without having to pay a penny um off the bat straight away as well um joe any any words for uh future students and even just the the community in general uh yeah i guess i guess the the main thing is just to not get intimidated by the tools um and i feel i feel like yeah things are definitely easier with unreal nowadays um but and I, I, but I also think that it's just, you know, there is always, there always has been this barrier that made real time something that wasn't quite accessible to everyone. Mm. It always was quite intimidating. And I, I feel like it's really time for those barriers to kind of come down and for people to, you know, to start using the tools and, and start uh, using real time, because I really do believe that it is the future. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think that a lot of it is just this kind of slow, uh, slow moving industry it's it's very slow to change um but yeah i really really stand by that that real time is the way forward and uh i think you you know you see that in the past throughout you know throughout history throughout the history of computing you'll see that real time uh all pr pretty much always you know ended up uh winning out and uh and you know and i also would say that just purely from a from financial perspective learning unreal engine makes a ton of sense these days uh because you've got you know movie studios coming in and using them uh using Un unreal and game studios as well so yeah uh, definitely a, a really good time to get on board with a uh, real time and unreal and um just for yourself uh, where can people find your work and um your resources i.e brushify.io yeah, so if you want to look at my personal work, uh, that's all on artstation.com forward slash Joe Garth, uh, J-O-E-G-A-R-T-H. And then on Brushify side of things, uh, you can find everything at brushify.io. Mm. So that's www.brushify.io. And uh, yeah, so that's basically just the the website and sort of uh, main front page for Brushify. Uh, alternatively, you can just go onto Unreal Marketplace and uh, you can see all the products on the page there and uh, check those out as well. So we'll definitely have those links in the description as well. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, yeah, man, that's it. Thanks to Joe for being our guest. Joe's Learn Squared course, Unreal Environments, is out now. The first lesson is free too. So head on over to learnsquared.com and inhabit new worlds. Till next time.